this idea of how to think strategically, how to understand purpose, assess your landscape, assess the climate, and then do what you need to do when you need to do it, how to develop a strategy applies across the board. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the interesting things that I think is applicable across the board is this difference in whys, like why of purpose, which I think is actually in this diagram, yeah. Why of purpose is really just like your purpose. Why are you doing what you're doing? But then everything else, your landscape, your climate, uh, the doctrine, your leadership, all of that is why they call it the why of movement, mm -hmm. right? Like, why am I making a certain move? And they, they use this chess illustration a lot <laughs> where, you know, and, and a lot of executives, they just love chess. Any executive I started book, playing gonna, like this week. I'm going to get yeah. smoked online. Like, it's, <laughs> it's really bad. But that's why I smile. But keep Chess is fun. It is. I'm going to learn. So the why of movement is where things get interesting. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of folks, the assertion is a lot of folks don't understand their climate, their landscape, any of those things. And the illustration is like playing chess without a board. Hmm. So you just have these pieces and you're like clicking on each piece and you don't really know how like the effect it's going to have on the board mm -hmm. i know it can move but i don't know where it moves you don't know what's going on and there's another common like business tool used a lot in a lot of places is the swat analysis mm -hmm. you remember those strengths yeah. weaknesses i forget the ant and that's great right like okay cool but you still don't understand your landscape or the mm -hmm. climate like it's it's chess without a board you understand the pieces you understand what they do but you don't have a strategy yet. You tracking with what I'm saying? Absolutely. So let's let's take in this and looking at it. You know, I find it really interesting because people struggle to find their purpose. They oftentimes believe it's it's this huge drawn out experience that it has to be. People feel like once they find a purpose, a purpose can't shift or change. So and especially in today's world with the constant overflow of stimulus technology, in order, I personally believe in order to find that purpose, you have to be willing to be still. You have to be willing to just sit down and truly focus and plan and lie. It's not a skill a lot of people have. So the question I'd ask to you, it would be, how would you find a purpose or how would you find your purpose from a personal career perspective? So the perspective helps because uh, mm. your purpose is going to be different depending upon the strategy you're creating. Mm -hmm. Like me personally, as just a human being, my my core purpose is to, you know, take care of my family. Absolutely. Try to make it so, you know, they have a life that I didn't and, you know, try to bring glory to my God. That, those are like purpose items personal. Yeah. But then in business, it gets interesting. Uh, and in your career, it gets interesting. What are you mm -hmm. really trying to do? So if you bring it to the career, right? I have my base purpose. So my career purpose needs to support my base. Mm -hmm. So for me, my purpose in my career is to be the best I can at what I do and uh, very tangibly make as much money in the shortest amount of time possible. <laughs> Like <laughs> that, Facts. that's that's it because it's really a sub purpose. It's not my entire purpose. Yeah, right? but it, it's it's okay to have multiple purposes. Yeah, like you're a dynamic individual. Exactly. Right, and I don't think work has to be your entire purpose. Mm -hmm. And uh, it really isn't for most people. Mm -hmm. They like they have lives outside of. The, I mean, there are people that it is their entire purpose in life, and they've dedicated themselves to. And that comes with its own consequences, Indeed. right? But if I'm going to define what I want out of my career, and it's being guided on the lines of how can I make the most in the shortest amount of time? How can I be a master of my craft, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. I believe that working for mastery of your craft also enhances your own personal worth and mm -hmm. uh, your confidence and all of these very positive effects just by working hard to be good at what you do. So with that in mind, then I go, okay, I have a job now, right? Mm -hmm. Now I'm in tech, okay? I have those core things. Now I have to figure out how to strategically navigate where I'm at. 
So I may come in as a role in a role of a software engineer, mm-hmm. right? But I'll speak personally a little bit more recently. Right? So I came in from being like cloud architect, software engineer to being a solutions engineer. Mm-hmm. That's because for me, I know that I want to understand how the business of software works. Mm-hmm. That's one of my goals. That's something that I'm fundamentally curious about. So I want to continue honing my technical skills while understanding how these products are built Mm -hmm. and shipped to customers and what customers actually like and blah, blah, blah. Like I want to understand how to be good at that. Absolutely. So I had been working as a practitioner in the space, building software a long time. Now I'm, I transferred over strategically to a solutions engineering role where now I'm advising other customers who are building software and helping them on their journey of building software by addressing specific problems. Mm-hmm. The problem space that I chose was this infrastructure automation DevOps space because that was what I saw was the biggest problem. Gotcha. And I asked myself, how big of a problem is this everywhere else? Mm-hmm. And the answer is, it's a problem everywhere in every company that builds software. Okay. So that's a little bit of the landscape. Like that's landscape thinking, right? I'm trying to understand what, not only what I'm doing, but how it plays. Exactly. How it's affecting things around you. Okay. So now I understand that I'm in a decent spot, at Mm -hmm. least from my assessment of the landscape, which could always be wrong, right? Like your strategy could be wrong. But it's a helpful aid in how you think about it. I think a big thing and what we researched about this beforehand is that this mapping tool, even for base level diagrams to how advanced they can get, it's it's what we call an agile, it's an information radiator. Mm-hmm. Because at the very least, it brings, brings things to the forefront visually. Mm-hmm. These types of things bring, whether it's the purpose, landscape, it makes them physical in some senses, visual in some senses, and keeps them just from being thoughts in your mind. And once you can visually see them and how they interconnect, then you can make decisions based on it. It's the same reason that they put boards with sticky notes up. It's because if everything's in your head, then nobody else can help you. But once you have these conversations and we're creating these diagrams, we're creating these um, maps, it helps those around to drive conversation to hopefully giving a more accurate view of the situation, even if that initial strategy is wrong. Yeah, it is. And it, and it allows you to apply concrete words and definitions to something that before a tool like this would be heavily instinctual. Mm-hmm. Right. So there would be people, individuals that pick up on patterns and then they're like, oh, this works. I'm going to keep doing that. Right. And then they keep doing that. And it's not that there's anything wrong with that, but it becomes very difficult with that approach to actually collaborate with others. True. Like, that's also an important (laughs) tenet of what I'm trying to do is to build a strategy in which you can collaborate with others, get clear feedback from others, right, on your strategy, on the pros and cons of certain approaches, or maybe I didn't see the landscape correctly, or maybe I'm not assessing the climate correctly, right? Maybe there's a different way that we could help our people, right? But, Gerald, <laughs> if I know the trends and no one else knows the trends, doesn't that make me more valuable in my current situation? Yeah, I, I'm, I, I would think so. I would think so, too. So what, is, what advantage do I gain by not hoarding that knowledge and riding those waves? I think it's just a fundamental uh, ideology thing. Like, what has been good that's been hoarded? <laughs> like, I just... That's Britain, but... You know, you. I'm, I'm much more of the thought process. I'm much more tied to the thought process of open source, of learning together, learning out loud. And if, even if you're trying to build a company, even if you hoard it for your company, right? If you're mm-hmm. a CEO and you're hoarding this knowledge for your company it's still difficult for people within your company to understand mm-hmm. your strategy. Absolutely. So even if you're hoarding it for yourself in your company, at the bare minimum, these tools can help you gain good feedback from the people that work with you. Exactly. 